to this webinar brought to you by Niagara's Chambers of Commerce, South Niagara, Lincoln, West Lincoln, Grimsby, Niagara-on-the-Lake, Niagara Centre and Greater Niagara. This particular dialogue is powered by Meridian Credit Union, Canada's second largest credit union of 92 locations across Ontario and 12 commercial banking centres managing over 24 billion in assets serving just under 400,000 members, including over 25,000 small business members. Last year, Meridian Credit Union expanded the offering across Canada through the launch of Modus Bank, a fully digital and national bank with members across Canada. My name is Mishka Balsam and I will be your moderator for the next hour. The purpose of this series is to convene for conversations that make us better understand how this pandemic will change, how we live, how we work and how our societies will function. How has this impacted our corporate partnerships, supply chains and business operations? How will it reshape our collective priorities, both for the private and public sector? It is my honor to have with us this morning the Honorable Mary Ng, Minister of Small Business, Export Promotion and International Trade, and MP for Niagara Centre, Vance Badaway, and MP for St. Catharines, Chris Biddle. Before we get started, Minister Ng is with us until 10.30, at which time our conversation continues with our local MPs. Zoom technology allows this session to be an interactive one. And if you want to ask questions by utilizing, please utilize the hand button or your Zoom screen on your Zoom screen or that chat feature. I'll monitor both and to make sure that we get to as many questions as possible. Mr. Biddle, may I ask you to take over to introduce our honorable guest, Minister Ng. Um, hi everyone. Thanks for uh, thanks for joining. Uh, and uh, first of all, I'd like to start with an apology. I don't have a particularly great background back here, um, but with a couple of toddlers, it's uh, this is the only place I could find in the house without them uh, coming in and uh, uh, and interrupting. So, again, thank you. It's so great to have uh, Mary Ying here. Um, she is the Minister of Small Business. I have to look down at my notes. Small Business Expert Promotion and International Trade. It's a long title. Uh, but she does a, a lot of work uh, for the government. Um, Mary grew up and she's been an advocate for small business since her election and she understands that growing up working in the family-owned restaurant um, as a kid um, and since her election um, in Markham has been a strong advocate for small business owners um, and, um, and was the really the key choice to become minister responsible for small business. So She's a great advocate. She's a great colleague. She's always there to answer our calls and pick up the phone and have a chat. Um, and it's great to have her here. Um, I don't want to ramble too much because we only have so much time with her. Um, so uh, Mary, thanks for being here and thanks for taking the opportunity to address uh, Niagara business owners in the Chamber of Commerce. Hi there. Thank you so very much. Um, bonjour everybody. And lovely to see you again, Mishka. And it's uh, always fantastic to spend time with my colleagues, particularly in uh, your local members of parliament, in Vance Badaway and in Chris Biddle. Chris, thank you so much for that um, introduction. And, uh, and I want to thank my colleagues for their advocacy on behalf of small businesses in your region, because throughout this entire time, what we've prided ourselves on is the ability to be able to listen to small businesses and to work with them throughout this pandemic so that your concerns, your issues, and what you need to help you through this difficult time is very, very much part of how we have done the work. And uh, that couldn't have happened without uh, me being able to work with both Vance and Chris as I do, but of course also with the chambers and the chamber networks across the country. So thank you so very much for that. Really, from the very beginning of this pandemic, we promised that we would listen and um, we would work with small businesses and with entrepreneurs and create the supports and make the adjustments that you have seen so that we can be responsive directly to you, the business owners and entrepreneurs to whom we are listening to, and to make sure that you are getting the supports that you need. And particularly as provinces like here in Ontario begin to safely reopen and restart, we need to continue to do that listening and working together with you so that we can get our supports right. And that the work isn't done, we continue to do this work 
So one of the things, uh, maybe what I'll do is just take a little bit just to explain the range of supports that have been out uh, for businesses and uh, happy to get into a conversation about this. But we heard from businesses that largely what they needed were in three broad themes. One, for those that have employees, it was really essential that you have the support to keep your team in place and to have your best asset, which is your human capital in place, even while you've closed down your operations or you've scaled them back significantly. We know that the, re that the road to restart is one that will be a better one, a more firm one, if you have your teams together, which is why we introduced a 75% wage subsidy where the federal government pays 75% of the wages of your staff, um, up to $57,000 uh, in that annual salary for that staff. And we've extended that until the end of August because we know how important it is for employers to be able to draw on that as you're slowly starting to restart your operations. The second theme we heard from businesses is help us keep our costs low and give us some help with the operating funds that we're going to need because we have bills to pay and while we're shut down and while revenues don't look the way uh, while they have taken a hit we need to make sure that uh, that we have some help to bridge us through this period so we've done a couple of things there one immediately we deferred tax payments so items like customs duties payments or GST, HSC, we've deferred those uh, right away. And just to give an order of magnitude about what that cost is, it's about a $30 billion interest-free loan to businesses across the country just with that one deferral. But it helped businesses by being able to send, well, keep the monies in their bank account rather than sending it to us. So that was helpful. And then of course, we introduced lending supports. The one that is the most uh, used, um, and it's, and it, and it makes a lot of sense because 98% of all our businesses across the country are small businesses. So the Canada Emergency Bank account is, uh, is the $40,000 loan. $10,000 of that is forgivable if you're able to repay it back by the end of 2022. So that's two and a half years away from now. But that really is that lending help for businesses who want to be able to uh, pay that additional 25%, for example, top up of that, wage of that wage subsidy so that you can keep your employees whole during this period. But it's actually paying for operating costs, your non-deferrable expenses, like whether it's rent or insurance payments or, um, you know, or maintenance, upkeep on machinery, animal feed, that sort of thing. So uh, the loan has been helpful to, break, to provide that kind of liquidity. And, uh, and right now over, 660,000 businesses in Canada have taken advantage of this loan with more to come, of course, because we've expanded that criteria so that more businesses will be eligible and that will be available very, very shortly through your uh, credit union and, uh, and financial institution. So we've heard uh, in those three themes, uh, give us some lending support, help us keep our costs down and help us with our payroll. So we've done a number of measures on that on that uh, in those areas. And of course, in the Niagara region, we know how important agriculture is, and we know the crucial role for temporary foreign workers, what they play in helping our farmers provide Canadians across the country with the good, healthy food that they rely on. And we know that the mandatory 14-day isolation period um, is there for everyone who arrives from abroad, including our foreign workers. And this is an effort to keep Canadians safe um, because it's, uh, it's a difficult time and has been a difficult time for our businesses and many of our farmers rely on this labor. So really pleased that, um, that what the government has introduced is a temporary policy that will reduce application, uh, applications for work permits from 10 weeks to 10 days. So really being able to make that efficient so that we can help our, you know, we can help our agriculture sector investing $50 million that are helping farmers. Um, certainly their fish harvesters are on the other, you know, sort of on the East and West Coast, but food production and processing employers um, also will benefit from this assistance. Um, and uh, it'll help them deal with the mandatory isolation period measures that uh, everyone has, uh, has taken up during this time. We've also recognized that uh, some of the measures that I talked about, whether it's wage subsidy or the loan, doesn't get at some of those smaller uh, enterprises or certainly 
companies or businesses in the rural areas. So in an effort to make sure that those businesses are supported, we are investing a billion dollars for the Regional Relief and Recovery Fund. So in Ontario, this is a special, it's equivalent to a special one-time $252 million fund supporting those small businesses that don't qualify for our other COVID-19 emergency measures. And that is available through FedDev Ontario. And um, we know, and we've certainly heard a lot of this, uh, your members have uh, talked to me about this as well, which is rent support, commercial rent support. We have introduced a 75% reduction for rent support for small businesses, particularly those that are the hardest hit. And applications, of course, for those are open. It is a forgivable loan that is made to the landlord if the landlord cuts your rent. Uh, cuts the rent for the small businesses by 75%. And I'm very um, pleased to hear that uh, today, I think yesterday or today in Ontario, uh, the province, because rent is not an area of federal responsibility, it's an area of provincial responsibility, but we stepped up and worked with the province. And I've been encouraging provinces to use the tools that they have at their disposal to ensure that this program is successful. And successful means that our small businesses get that 75% rent relief. So I'm pleased to see that Ontario, uh, just uh, in the last day or so, has uh, issued a temporary ban on commercial evictions for those small businesses that qualify under the rent relief program. So that's really good. And then the final thing I would say is that the effects of COVID-19 has, uh, has, has impacted global trade. So this means that for Niagara Region's integrated economy, it, uh, your manufacturers who export around the world, your builders who are relying on imported materials, or the vineyards and the tourism operators, we know that you're suffering unprecedented, uh, unprecedented loss of business during this time. And, um, and our measures that I've talked about are intended to provide as best support as we can to you, and that work will continue. But on the international trade side, it is to ensure that I keep working through this crisis with my international partners, those in the G20 countries, through the World Trade Organization, the WTO, the Asia Pacific Economic Cooperation Group, and many other like-minded countries to make sure that our supply chains, our global supply chains, remain open and that businesses continue to do their work internationally, and that essential goods and services, particularly agricultural, uh, agricultural products, as well as medical supplies, continue to flow at this critical time. So this is a bit of a summary of the work, but as I've said, uh, and as my colleagues uh, you know, will say all the time, I mean, our job right now is to make sure that we are supporting Canadians through this global pandemic. It's to save as many Canadian jobs and businesses as we possibly can in the face of this crisis. And it's to help you with the restart and that rebuild as it becomes safe to do so and to uh, just essentially to have your back every step of the way. So I really appreciate the time that you've given to me. Thank you so much. And I'm looking forward to a conversation uh, with, with uh, the Chamber. Thanks. Thank you so very much, Minister. We really appreciate it. We also wanted to say on behalf of our members that we truly appreciate the government, all levels of government's actual responsiveness uh, to this crisis, uh, the collaboration that you have shown in working together, and uh, above all, the speed at which uh, critical decisions have been made for businesses. So uh, thank you very much on that end of it. Um, as I mentioned a couple of minutes ago, if you have a questions, uh, please use uh, two features that are there. One of them is the hand feature that indicates uh, that you want to ask a question another option is to chat one so we've had a couple of questions coming forward and uh, as we have you for just a limited period of time uh, let me start out with this this has come Naga is known for its tourism sector this has come forward from the tourism industry has the government examined additional sector specific programs for the worst hit sectors such as tourism and hospitality um, because their hardest hit um, from all of them, they will take the longest to recover. And has there been any consideration given to that? Um, Mishka, absolutely. Throughout this entire period, the focus has absolutely been to make sure that our businesses are supported. And in the Niagara region, 
tourism and hospitality is such a vital part of, um, of your local economy. And we want to make sure that you are supported through this time. So on tourism, um, I guess, in addition to the many measures that I talked about, in tourism, for example, through FedDev Ontario, we have uh, provided $3 million of uh, funding to the Tourism Industry Association of Ontario so that they can work to provide financial relief to destination marketing organizations across Southern Ontario that are experiencing the significant revenue shortfalls. And, um, and I would say that this work continues we know how hard the tourism and the hospitality sector is. We, it's why we have um, continued to listen and to work with the sectors to understand the particular needs so that, uh, so that we are filling and meeting those gaps. I would say that there's more work to be done um, on this and, um, and to sort of stay tuned because uh, both myself and Minister Jolie, who has the responsibility for, uh, for the tourism file across the country, is working very diligently to make sure that we uh, help the sector because it is a vibrant economic uh, you know, uh, participant. And we, uh, we definitely wanna make sure that we continue that support. Yeah, I appreciate it. Uh, there's two questions that have come in, uh, one from Chantal and Nicholas, they're the same. Uh, can you give us a date when the CBA will be uh, available for those who receive remuneration from dividends or tentative date? Um, about how to move forward on this one. Yes, uh, I, you know, thank you for this. I mean, you'll see that what we have done on the SEBA program is make the adjustments by listening to our businesses. And I know that this lending support is just so important because I know that you have bills to pay. I know that you have uh, those costs that, uh, that you bore. So, um, so making sure that you get access to that lending support is critical. I would say just stay in touch with your financial institution we're very, very close to, uh, they are very, very close to making that available to their customers. And, uh, and I, you know, while I can't give you a specific date, I can tell you it's very, very shortly. We've been working very hard, you know, with the banks and the credit unions to make sure that they uh, are able to deliver that, this, this additional piece, well, SIBA, but to this additional piece of uh, this additional group of, um, important small businesses so just stay in touch with your uh, bank or credit union and uh, and it will be available there very very shortly perfect thank you very much um there's a question that has come in from jessica friesen uh, and it's related to the proposed 10 sick days uh, for employees and uh, what has been discussed uh, regarding this aspect of it and um there basically, if you can give us some insight on, on this aspect of it, especially as it links again to the provinces. Yeah, absolutely. I mean, throughout all of this, we have uh, taken an approach where, where, uh, where we have provided federal leadership working with our partners in the provinces and the municipalities to make sure that we're all doing, that we're all working together to, uh, to deal with what is the you know what is the crisis which is a health crisis and um and we've made good progress so far in flattening the curve but we're not out of uh, we're not out of the waters we still have to um we still have to uh take advice from public health around measures like physical distancing and still continuing to practice um uh, you know, uh, good hygiene, um, and uh, and and making sure that as we are restarting our businesses, that it's done in a way where we are also protecting our workers and our customers and uh, and ourselves as um, as business uh, as business owners. So, making sure that there is some accommodation for the workers in this is uh, what this is all about. It's making sure that um, that. If you have someone who is in your employ, it actually is uh, it actually is better for the employer to have some accommodation so that that worker, if they are sick, to not be there, uh, so that we so that everyone is working together to continue to manage the health situation while we get into a restart with the economy. Many of the businesses that I've talked to, large and small, would say to me, the economy and health go hand in hand now. Customer confidence, consumer um, confidence about coming out into 
your establishments and so forth is 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 tied to the health of, of Canadians. So they want to see that there are measures in place to ensure that health of Canadians are looked after and at the same time businesses are supported so that in that restart they begin building out the confidence that uh, customers are relying on your employees are relying on and that you I know um, are going to absolutely be doing because it's good it's good for business thank you very much I know it's a very sensitive uh, question and uh, it's a hard one for businesses as they're faced with uh, such decline in revenues uh, and uh, and challenges at this point that uh, this this is a difficult one for them. This one has come forward from a Niagara on the Lake actually winery, uh, and uh, they are asking if for financial support as they're trying to actually export more uh, wine to the Asian market. They're trying to actually take part in upcoming trade shows uh, there, and they were wondering if there's anything that will be made available to them uh, to promote their wine uh, in on the, in the international market? Well, that's a really terrific question, I mean, and, uh, and in that question, you've covered both sides of my portfolio. One, which is to help our Canadian small businesses thrive and be, and grow um, in Canada, and in that growth to actually access the international customers that we have um, uh, that is available to so many of our businesses here in Canada and helping them through that journey in in exporting helping businesses who haven't quite done it yet but looking at those new markets to uh, grow into and those who are to support them along the way the Canadian Trade Commissioner Service uh, you know who I have responsibility for has been working tirelessly throughout this period during COVID-19. On the one hand, as I said earlier, part of the work is making sure that global supply chains continue to remain uh, flowing. And on the other, it's helping our Canadian businesses who are operating abroad to make sure that they have that support, that continued support in country. And so whether it is dealing with issues of importing or exporting um, at borders or dealing with sort of some of the delays or some of the kinks that have occurred as a result of COVID-19. The Trade Commissioner Service has been there to help and that also means helping you pursue those customers in um, in the new marketplace, whether they be in Asia Pacific or elsewhere. We have some really good agreements that we've negotiated, like the CPTPP that covers many countries in the Asia Pacific marketplace. We're also looking at how we can support our businesses in a much more digital way. They've already been doing that in, in light of COVID-19 and we're gonna need to do more of that. So this is where we continue to work with businesses. I am, um, I'm looking forward to making sure that we support businesses even more than we are, particularly for those who are looking to expand and grow um, into the international marketplace. Thank you very much. It's so much needed. Um, there's a lot of talk about that there will be a second wave of COVID-19. Uh, um, what kind of conversations are taking place uh, at, your lab, uh, at your level of government to saying like, this is how we have to continuously support businesses and employees as we are not only heading into recovery, but potentially also have to deal with the second wave? Well, absolutely. I mean, um, those, as I said earlier, the health of Canadians and the economy really do go hand in hand. We've learned a lot through, um, through COVID-19. We've also developed some capabilities through COVID-19. So the test, so where we are working nationally with uh, the provinces and certainly through the public health, uh, you know, the public health stream, making sure that there is appropriate testing, making sure that there is uh, the work that is being done um, across the, um, you know, across the country to ensure that we are, you know, we are able to, uh, you know, contact trace those who may have, uh, you know, who may, you know, have tested positive as a, um, you know, from the testing. So, so the health so the health work is really important because shoring up that capability, the really amazing work that our healthcare workers have been doing is going to really give uh, our healthcare system and Canadians confidence that there is a method to which we are going to help manage, uh, help manage the spread of COVID-19. A second wave, should that come, is very different than where we were when we had to, you know, when, when, 
it just hit the world and we had to respond quite rapidly, but we have responded. And with respect to businesses, it's making sure that our businesses are right now weathering through this very tough period so that we can bridge them through um, into that restart and into that recovery, but in that restart and recovery to continue to support you along the way. And this is where I think it's just been so important. I really appreciated the work we're doing with the Canadian Chambers. Throughout this, we collaborated with the National Chamber we created the chamber created with a number of partners including the local chambers the canada business resilience network this is where we have a direct line of being able to just collaborate together rapidly and to pivot rapidly um, we've also created a canadian business resilience service so this is a service of a number of um, financial advisors and accountants. We've, we're, we've, we've introduced a bit of a pilot for those small businesses that are the hardest hit and who otherwise wouldn't have access to such a service. So they are able to, seven days a week, it was four weeks, uh, four weeks pilot, I think we're now sort of into the, the second week, but it's, it's so that businesses can get a bit of that support. So part of it is financial support, the other is the intangible support that the chambers, and that the Business Resilience Network uh, and our women's ecosystem is providing to entrepreneurs and to businesses all the way across the country so that they can actually get the support that they need. And into Restart and Recovery, we will need to continue to do that. Yeah, and I'm actually, as I mentioned as well, it's like I'm so um, appreciative of the collaborative effort that has actually taken place uh, between the private sector and the public sector in mm -hmm. trying to come up with solutions and move forward with those solutions, communicate those ones yeah. to the people that are there. I think it's critical. Um, I think, Minister, we have, um, I think, enough time for one more question. Uh, and this has come up from, uh, it's regarding small businesses, startup support that is there. Um, COVID-19 has taught us that a lot of the need for businesses do, uh, to move over to a much more digitally, a digital platform that is there. E-commerce, e-marketing, uh, high in demand. How will the government help business adapt to this new reality and how will you support Canadian startups? Absolutely. I mean, uh, you're completely right. I mean, the, 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 some of the best stories that I am hearing right now about business innovation and business resilience is exactly as you've described. Um, maybe the best way to do it is to share a couple of stories and really to end off by saying, of course, we're going to be working with businesses so that we can better support you in this, uh, in this area. And uh, there will be sort of more to come in the days to come. But, uh, but I think about a local bakery. It's a female owned enterprise. Her bakery had to shut down because of COVID-19 and, um, and to all Canadian businesses that have had to do that. I, you know, I, I didn't say this before, um, but thank you, thank you, thank you, because we're all in this. But this bakery, she employs five people, had to shut down, got access to the wage subsidy, so managed to keep her people on staff and uh, we paid the 75%. But her baking business, she saw the demand through just phone calls or people sort of sending her an online, like sort of an email. So she took advantage of the small business loan. With that, she paid the other 25% uh, top up so that all of her employees, uh, all five of them were paid 100% just as if it was before COVID. She invested the other part of the money on, um, on an online ordering system. So all of a sudden, while she her doors were closed from a retail side, she's able to facilitate that additional revenue, but more importantly, meet the needs of some of her customers and uh, and some of her staff that would have worked sort of the front counter now are managing that uh, online ordering system and curbside pickup. So that's and I'm seeing that all all around. I mean, another business that I thought was really terrific and maybe again, relevant to the Niagara area. It's a brewery. Now, this story actually comes from uh, the Atlantic coast, but, you know, a brewery who, uh, you know, who has a, a limited seating capacity, but now, of course, is really half of that because of physical distancing, but also took out the SIBA loan and invested in a, you know, in a canning um, uh, machinery to do canning so that he can increase sort of the takeout portion of um you know of the of that side of the brewery's business so that again it's to be able to supplement or just not even supplement it's pivoting that uh that revenue that revenue source so still being able to do what you love but able to pivot it and using digital as a way of being able to do that so stay tuned there is you know we are definitely looking forward to supporting businesses in this area 
And you're absolutely right. I think there's so many businesses that have shown amazing innovation and creativity to pivot actually and to help out uh, during this crisis too. Um, it's 10.30. We are going to continue the conversation uh, with uh, MPs uh, Chris Biddle and Vance Badaway, but I want to say on behalf of my colleagues and our board, thank you very much uh, and on behalf of all attendees today and all of uh, the other chambers uh, in Naga, thank you so very much for being with us this morning. It's critical for us to have this open dialogue. We appreciate it deeply and I'm going to pass it on to uh, Mr. Badaway. Thank you. thank you. Thank you, And uh, Mary, as always, thank you for your tireless efforts on, on behalf of all of us throughout the country, but particularly in Niagara. Uh, I know just yesterday I got a hold of Mary, and, and, and being the responsive uh, and, and, and approachable person that she is, uh, she got back to me within minutes. And, and uh, I want to thank you for that. So thank you for being here today. I know you have a busy day ahead of you, uh, but most of all, and more importantly, thank you for how responsive you're, you're being uh, for all those uh, from from one side of the country to the other. And, and once again, specifically to Niagara, uh, we appreciate your efforts. Thanks, Ben. See you later. Take care yourself. Bye. All right, we are moving over to uh, more questions uh, and this time for uh, Mr. Biddle and Mr. Badaway. We have a hand that has been raised uh, and I would like to uh, get to. Uh, this is Ruth Unrau, uh, who's probably familiar to uh, most attendees and everyone uh, probably on this call. So um, Ruth, the mic is all yours, I think. Um, let me see. I might need some. Are we good? Uh, we're perfect. It's all yours. Hi, everybody. Um, I don't know. I, I guess Minister Ng is gone, but I sure appreciate her time today. That, uh, that was great. Um, my question is around, and Chris, you and I have had this conversation, is around childcare. Um, when we're talking about an economic recovery, there doesn't seem to be a lot of discussion around how we're going to get our children taken care of. And I believe that this is a huge part of, our, uh, of an economic issue. Um, and I'm just wondering what steps are being taken to, to make sure that we've got Childcare that is safe and affordable and accessible to everyone. We've got a lot of low wage uh, earners that are going to need childcare to get back to work. And um, some of the things that I'm hearing out there about the prices, because the cost of operating is going to go up so substantially, how people are going to be able to afford that. So I'm wondering if the federal government is looking at that in any way. Thank you very much, Ruth. Um, and maybe I'll start out with you, uh, Mr. Biddle, on this question. Sure. Um, thanks, Ruth, for the question. And it's something that uh, maybe it's not talked about enough in the media, but it's something that's definitely being talked about behind the scenes. Um, it's predominantly a provincial issue, but that doesn't mean that the federal government doesn't have a role to play. We've invested in childcare in the past. I know in our platform, it was something that uh, we discussed in terms of having more accessible childcare spaces available to people, but we can see the recovery data in terms of people going back to work and it's disproportionately men going back to work. Um, and if schools remain closed, if daycares are going to remain closed, this is going to be a problem for um, uh, our recovery and our economic recovery. And so it is being discussed. It is something we need to work very closely with the provinces on because it's ultimately their jurisdiction, but it is something that is definitely being discussed and is key to uh, an eco a true economic restart. Yeah, we can't second that enough how critical it is. When we hear the stories from even women who own their own business uh, and they have uh, no one to rely on at this period of time and the same goes for the staff. <laughs> Uh, we really appreciate uh, uh, leadership on this particular issue. One of the questions that has come forward, and Ben, uh, Mr. Barry, I might direct it your way. Uh, it is, um, how long do you expect the current support programs to last? And can you give us an idea of an ending point? Not necessarily in a date, uh, but in things that are maybe key economic indicators uh, that we have to have reached, uh, knowing that then those programs and those supports wouldn't be available anymore. Mr. Badaway? Great question. And it's a question that we get asked almost daily with respect to our expectations and how long this is going to go on for. Uh, I'll answer the question in two manners. Uh, one is, is that th this is not going to go away anytime soon. 
when, when people ask me that question on when it's going to go away, uh, my answer is very simple, when we get a vaccine. Uh, until then, we have to regionally uh, analyze the numbers and, of course, open up as, as the numbers allow us to. Uh, with that said, the, the second part of my answer, specific to the programs, is we'll roll with the programs as that information comes before us. Uh, it's hard to anticipate. It could be in a month, it could be in four months. Um, but as long as, as Mary mentioned earlier, Mr. Ng mentioned earlier, as long as those challenges exist, we hear it and we are expected to react accordingly. So we've already extended some of the programs uh, well past August. And, and if need be, we're prepared to, to continue to extend these programs while the challenges exist. Uh, but can I give you a definitive date? No. Uh, hopefully we get through this sooner rather than later, but ultimately it's gonna be when we get a vaccine where we're ultimately through this. But up until that time, uh, the supports that will be needed we're expected to, to, to hand out uh, as we are now. Uh, but um, again, it's, it's gonna be up to, the, uh, up to the Prime Minister as well as up to the different departments to analyze those numbers and of course uh, the bottom line as Mary said earlier is to listen and, and the more we hear from you uh, that those challenges do exist then the expectation is for us to react accordingly. Thank you very much. Um, this is a question that has come in from uh, Deborah Forrester. I, I think it has kind of an ov provincial overlap on it but uh, Deborah is asking what relief can campgrounds and public vacation resorts expect and or can you share any timing and any additional restrictions for the upcoming season? Um, I think some of this is uh, more provincially led than it is a federal issue um, but um, any indications on maybe uh, Mr. Biddle, if you want to just maybe just touch base on it? It's, uh, it's definitely provincial. Um, the federal government has treated this um, like 13 separate outbreaks as, as it should be. Um, and so the province has a much better handle on um, the public health data here. And so um, we've deferred to them. They've issued the emergency orders and they will, they will decide and um, we'll, Hopefully, hear more in the uh, in the coming days. Yeah. If I can add, if I can add to that too, Mishka, uh, I know I've been dealing with uh, a few of them here locally in in, uh, in the southern part of the region, and albeit the the openings, as Chris mentioned, are up to the province and, and things of that nature. Uh, there are still programs that that we're offering at the federal level that can be that can be taken advantage of uh, once they do open in terms of the wage subsidy and and, and the forty thousand dollar. Uh, the loan and, and the list goes on with respect to the menu of service or uh, benefits that we're offering. So yes, it's up to the province on one hand to, to allow them to open, but on the other hand, when it comes to their operating and, and, and to some extent their capital, uh, tapping into some of these programs may be of great assistance. Yeah, thank you very much. Uh, this is a question from Lulu Lee. Uh, will the SERP be continued for small business owners that will need further assistance until their sector can become fully functional again, such as tourism? I think it's a recognition that not all sectors will recover at the same time, at the same speed. Um, and um, what are the government's plans on this one? And maybe, Mr. Badaway, if I can ask you this one first. The SERP, as you know, as many know, has been extended to, to August 31st. Uh, and with that, again, as I said earlier, uh, monitoring and rolling with what we're hearing, uh, if, if the extension is needed past that point, then, then I'm sure, again, we'll react accordingly. So, you know, it's, it's, let's face it, folks, at the end of the day, we're in unprecedented times right now. And we all recognize from day one that there's no playbook in this. And, and that playbook is getting populated as we, as we go on day after day. And, and having these webinars, for example, uh, are a perfect opportunity for us to hear these these concerns, and therefore we pass it on to to our colleagues to then therefore react accordingly. So, with that said, and directly to the question, um, again, I can't give you a, a direct answer with respect to yes or no will it be extended. But rest assured, the more we hear in terms of those uh, concerns being passed on to us, we pass them on, and of course, again, we, our expectation is, is that those that make the decisions up in Ottawa will react accordingly. Okay, thank you. Um, if I can just uh, clarify, it's just. Um, there are too many acronyms, uh, four-letter acronyms, starting with C during this uh, crisis, and it was the uh, the wage subsidy that's been extended through uh, August. Uh, we haven't yet heard on the uh, on the CERB, um, but um, we, as Vance said, we'll let people know either way once we uh, once we hear that. Perfect. 
Um, this is a question that's coming in from um, or it's Alex Jenis who would like to ask a question. Alex, uh, known to probably most uh, participants here as well, is the owner of uh, Henry Honda and Subaru Naga. And um, I think, Alex, uh, the mic should be yours now. Let me see. Almost. Uh, let me see, and I might need to... Um, can you hear me okay? Oh, I can hear you. Hi, yes. guys. How are you? Thank you for being with us this morning, Alex. Yeah. Thanks very much, gentlemen. I appreciate it, Mishka. Uh, gentlemen, I, I know that this is probably a, 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 a provincial matter, but I, I, I fear that, uh, or I believe that the federal government's probably going to have to get involved. When it comes to municipalities not being able to balance their budgets, and the, the concern is obvious that, that when this is over, we're, we're left with a, a massive burden and, and ultimately uh, these municipalities are supposed to be balanced, have balanced budgets at the end of the year and not carry deficits. Since that is clear that that is not going to happen, does the federal government have any uh, criteria or at minimum recommendations on uh, municipalities embarking on any belt tightening? Uh, between now and the time that, that we're reconciling budgets. The, the city of St. Catharines uh, recently had a, a, a voracious, uh, voracious debate on, on the matter. It's pretty clear that they're going to come in at about a $10 million deficit, and at the same time, they voted to keep the municipal golf course open. The optics are horrible, and ultimately, if there's not belt tightening now by municipalities, when will there be? And, and I, I believe that the, the federal government's going to be called upon to bail municipalities out when it's pretty clear that, in my humble opinion, that they're not doing their part to, uh, to minimize the burden to taxpayers and the federal government and provincial government's budgets. Um. Thank you very much. Uh, there has actually been a second question regarding uh, municipal government coming in as well. But uh, maybe if we uh, if we uh, take a, a look at Alex's question, uh, Mr. Biddle, do you want to take this first, and then maybe um, I'll pass it on to Mr. Badaway in light of his history uh, with municipal government. Absolutely, and uh, Alex, you're right. It is uh, it is an issue of uh, provincial jurisdiction. Municipalities are creatures of the province, creations of the province by statute. Um, and, but as we've seen through this crisis, we're willing to work with the provinces um, to help out. And so those discussions will continue. Um, and, at, and, and if, if the province comes to us and the provinces come to us and there's a deal to be made, we're happy to be at the table. We've shown our willingness to do that. And that's going to be uh, what we continue to do through the crisis. Mr. Badaway, on the same topic. Well, it's, you know, and I'll speak for my former life as a mayor, uh, a couple of things. One, municipalities can't run a deficit. It's, it's not uh, accordingly to the Municipal Act. Uh, with that, their budgets have already been established going into this year. Uh, most, if not all, have been uh, passed. And, and now, of course, with that said, uh, a lot of the revenue side of the balance sheet is, is hurting because of, uh, because of the obvious. Uh, with that, um, I'm not going to speak with respect to the discipline of each municipality that's their responsibility and of course uh, I guess the big sister or the big brother to that under the municipal act is the province but what I will speak on is is, is some of the help that we can give them uh, I've been working with uh, most if not all mayors throughout the region for the past few weeks uh, some have more challenges than others and with that said and as I said earlier listening learning reacting accordingly uh, I've been on, on the phone a lot with the, the appropriate ministers, Minister Jolie, uh, in terms of tourism from Niagara Falls, Niagara Lake, and some others, uh, Minister Morneau, with respect to ultimately what the ask is on behalf of all municipalities throughout the entire country. The FCM currently has a $14 billion ask uh, to attach to more operating uh, with respect to the fixed costs that municipalities have to adhere to, as you do as business people on a daily, monthly basis. Um, we've already announced uh, capital dollars accelerating the gas tax uh, from 2020 and 2021 by municipalities so that therefore they can accelerate two years worth of infrastructure uh, work in now. Uh, of course, part of that reasoning is, is, is to create economy, uh, a healthier economy with the people that would otherwise be doing that work. Um, but as Chris said, you know, we're here to advocate on behalf of municipalities with respect to what their needs are. 
uh, right now COVID related in terms of operating. Uh, and of course, attached to that, the, the capital abilities that we have through our infrastructure programs. Uh, going back to my original comments, I think it's up to municipalities to be disciplined um, as are the people that you put in place and I would trust that they would do that. Thank you very much. Um, this has been a conversation that has been actually going on uh, for the last couple of months. What if this reality that we're in right now actually becomes the new reality, meaning that um, maybe the vaccine does not prove to be as perfect as what we are hoping it to be. It might not be available as quickly to us as what we are anticipating. Um, what is the government's uh, plan for economic recovery um, if this becomes the new normal as we're moving forward? And um, Ms. Biddle, if I could ask you maybe to take this one. Sure. Um, it's, a, it's an interesting hypothetical question. Right now we're focused on what's the crisis right now. Um, there, seems to be, there seems to be a lot of progress on trend, um, vaccines and treatments, but those could also be years off. Um, and we will, address, we will address the challenges as they come to us. It's hard to say what the new normal is going to be um, when it can change. A month ago, we may not have said we would be opening and starting to reopen this month. And so we're going to take it one step at a time. The goal is to, for us at the local level, for Vance and I to hear from local businesses, to hear from local residents, to see what the challenges are and how we can help that at the federal level and to take that up um, and to work with our partners. And so if it does become the new normal, that is something that all levels of government are going to have to work together on, even though there is clearly defined areas that we all work within. Canadians want us to work together, and that's what we've been doing, and that's what we'll continue to do. Thank you. Um, there's more questions that are coming in regarding the uh, 10 uh, sick days, paid sick days. Um, and I was wondering if uh, you could both address them. You are both uh, two uh, MPs who are extremely close to the business community. You continuously engage with businesses and owners. You hear the struggle that they're going through. And now it's the question of the 10 sick days to be paid. Um, can you give me your thoughts on it and to saying like, how can we alleviate that additional pressure uh, while we are seeing so many businesses struggling? Um, Mr. Badaway? Well, and I think it's a great question. And I think for the most part, uh, as Mary said earlier, it's a support that we want to give business, not only because of the fact of the situation that we're in, but in, in, in preparing to protect employees. Uh, and the business workplace. At the end of the day, we want to make sure that any sickness doesn't get passed on to others, uh, other colleagues. Um, this is a discussion that we're, just, uh, that we're in constant uh, with the provinces. Uh, but I think the biggest concern from the, from, the, from the business community, I know being 35 years in business myself in, the, in my former life, um, you know, the concern is it will be taken advantage of. And, and then therefore, what position does it put a business in? Uh, those are the things, as Chris mentioned earlier, that we want to hear. Those are the concerns that we want to hear so that when we're discussing this with the province, we can bring those concerns forward. But ultimately, at the end of the day, you know, the supports that we're putting in place for that reason is to protect not only the individuals, but also the workplace itself. And the, the other thing businesses have to look at, though, is from, from the business side of it, what happens when an outbreak is traced to your business? What happens if, if we're fighting against these 10 sick days? And I understand the difficulty and the government has offered assistance, the federal government has offered assistance to the province and there's no, no deal in place. Um, but if your business, if your employees have to go to work and don't have any mechanism to stay home and can't afford to stay home, if they come in with mild symptoms, they infect yourself, your other workers, and it becomes public that you're the source of the outbreak what's going, that going to do to the long-term outlook? And so in the last question, we talked about a different time. This is a different time. And um, if, you're, if businesses are, are advocating for no paid sick days, this may be something that you want to analyze because it may be very bad PR. We saw a business owner in, um, I believe, Pelham, uh, potentially bring um, the virus into their workplace. And it was a um, big uproar. It may or may not have been connected to a death in the community. Is that what is that what business owners want? And so we understand the struggle. The federal government, the provincial government are going to be there to assist, but we want to have a plan where 
uh, where people feel that they can stay at home because we, if this virus is going to be with us for another year or two or whatever the case is, um, we can see, and if we can see across the country, provinces that have reacted well, businesses are open quicker, the economy is returning back to normal. We want to keep that going. And that, that may mean employees feel safe going home and staying home if they have symptoms. I do believe that moving forward that we will respond to symptoms that our employees and colleagues show quite differently than what we have done in the past. I think that, that our threshold on this one has significantly changed. Um, it's just as business threshold when it comes to cost are, um, are tremendous at the same time. On the sense of the rent assistance program, this has been a question that has been um, or oh, there's a lot of questions around the program. The question here is, will it get reviewed uh, to ensure that all small business tenants can benefit from it? Uh, is it being reviewed? There's a lot of questions uh, when landlords don't participate in it. Uh, nearly just under 90% of um, small businesses uh, don't own their premise. They're renting the premise from someone else. Uh, so this is a critical, a high cost to them. Uh, is it being reviewed? Is it being adjusted? Um, Mr. Biddle? Um, all of the programs that we have announced are being reviewed as we've seen from like the Canadian business account to the wage subsidy to whatever program we're willing to make adjustments as they go on. I was happy to see um, the Ford government finally announced that there would be a suspension of commercial evictions, um, which hopefully, it, it, it's been very bizarre to me to see how short-sighted landlords are or some landlords have been in this crisis to want to evict good businesses, businesses that can get back on their feet um, because there won't be a rush of new tenants whenever this crisis is over. So um, the direct answer is, are we willing to review it? Yes, and we have to work with the, our provincial partners because they have the legislative control over the landlord and tenant relationship. Okay, thank you very much. Um, I'm trying to, I'm looking at the time and I'm just going to try to get to two or three more questions that are here. Uh, we have seen in Europe the borders opening uh, to non-commercial traffic. Uh, when and how do you see the border being reopened uh, for exactly that? Mr. Badaway? For non-commercial traffic? Non-commercial, yes. Again, again it's, it's, it's based on the numbers. It, it's, uh, it's a day-to-day -day monitoring in terms of what we're seeing uh, with respect to what is happening on the other side of the borders, but as well as happening here. Uh, the Prime Minister just announced yesterday uh, the opening for families, uh, but at the end of the day, when it comes to non-commercial traffic, it's based on the numbers that we're experiencing. Um, not until, once again, we get a vaccine, will you see, in my opinion, uh, borders opened up 100%. Okay. And Mr. Biddle, maybe on the same question, and it's a related one that's asking, are you in support of regional uh, reopening versus um, the countrywide reopening at the same time or province-wide. Mr. Biddle? Oh, absolutely. And um, it seems to be based on public health. And I talked about the federal government looking at this as 13 separate outbreaks in terms of the provinces and territories. But if we look within the province itself, it seems that um, how, how densely populated an area is seems to be more impacted so that Toronto um, should probably be opening later than the rest of us. And we've seen this work, for example, in Alberta, where Calgary opened at, or I don't think has yet gone to the next stage, but will. Um, and it's, it's worked well, and the public health, our public health experts are saying we can do it this way. And um, we're basing our decisions on public health experts. And so I think it's a workable, uh, workable option. Yeah, I appreciate it. The um, something we've heard from business even before the crisis was that the red tape burden was too great for them. Um, what can the government do to clear the way uh, for economic recovery and the reduction of red tape? And especially when we've seen so many decisions being made at such a speed, there seem to be the we look at it and we're saying, well, decisions can be made uh, much faster than maybe what we've seen in the past. Uh, does it make you look at government differently, at uh, policies differently, and do you see it as being an opportunity to be more responsive to the needs of the recovery? And um, Mr. Biddle, if I ask you maybe first on this one, and then I'll... Sure. Um, red tape is something that we've, we've committed to reducing since our election, and we've 
gone through the regulations and talked to talk to people but we do also have to be careful because it's it's easy to label all regulations as red tape but when we are looking at health and safety um there may be there may be some hurdles there may be some issues but they're there for a reason and so um if there these are the types of situations where if you're in a specific industry and there's a specific policy that doesn't make any sense to call Vance and I, and that's the way that we can bring these things forward rather than saying, um, just using the term red tape, knowing what's in an industry like wine, like tourism, whatever the case is, if there's something specific, give our offices a call, we're happy to talk to you, and then we can take it back to the minister that sa and say, this makes no sense, here's the reason why, let's get rid of it. Yeah. Thank you. I do believe that uh, the solutions lie in the details uh, of each one of them that's there. Um, we, are heading, we are in a recession, we're heading into a recession. Um, do you anticipate a wave of economic protectionism uh, in this economic climate, uh, especially from the United States, our largest trading partner, uh, which will have a significant in, uh, impact on so many businesses? Mr. Badaway, if I could ask you maybe to take a look at this one. Well, that's a great question, and we went through some of that uh, last year with the steel and aluminum tariff. In my riding, which was a big, great, uh, a terrible impact, I should say, it wasn't a great impact. It was uh, it affected a lot of companies, ASW, I, uh, IMT, and, and many uh, fabricators and steel producers. Uh, so we went, we went through that once. Uh, will we go through it again? Uh, based on the discussions that we've had in Washington, uh, the answer, I guess, uh, can be said no, but. That was yesterday, and now we're looking at tomorrow. Uh, so when we, when we move ahead, and this is what's been front of mind with me, and I'm glad you asked the question because I wanted to mention it to all the folks out there, is that what's front of mind, although Chris and I and many of the MPs throughout the country are dealing with what we're dealing with today, COVID, um, what's been front of mind with me personally is, is, is moving on three, four months down the road to stay ahead of it economically, as well as putting the post-COVID economic recovery in place. Uh, as I said earlier, we're, we're under a new norm. Uh, we're populating that playbook, and a lot of that's business related. Uh, we're listening, learning, reacting. But equally as important is, is, is for you folks to hit, take advantage of the programs, the cues, uh, which is the wage, uh, wage subsidy, which again, as mentioned earlier, has uh, uh, been extended to the late August, and, and of course, the CERB and, and other programs for today. But equally as important to communicate with us for tomorrow, especially as we, we, we look at it at it on a tri-national basis. And I say tri-national because right now we have we have three trade agreements that are paramount. We have CPTPP, we have uh, we have the CETA, and we have the new NAFTA. Working off the old NAFTA, working into a new NAFTA. With that, it has three nations, Mexico, United States, and Canada. Uh, in our discussions with all three countries, uh, protectionism is on the back burner. What's on the front burner coming out of COVID is in fact working closer together so that we integrate a recovery together as three nations. And then therefore that, that, that relationship, uh, cross-border relationship between three countries, then therefore a springboard is a springboard and or gets us out of the gate that much quicker. Uh, especially for you folks that are working with export import, uh, as Chris said, work with us because we have to hear what those challenges, concerns are and, ex and as well as the expectations. So, so moving forward, you know, here in Canada, we're positioned quite well. With our trade agreements, we're attached to 1.8 billion consumers. So that catapults us from a small country to a big economic country because of those trade agreements and the people that we attach ourselves to. So we have to work internationally, yes, but also working closely with those trinational partners, Mexico, United States, and us, uh, to really ensure that people recognize uh, the amount of people that we have attached to our economy, but as well to work with them to ensure that protectionism once again is on the back burner. Thank you very much. I'm conscious of time, so I am I'm deeply appreciative that you're with us. Uh, can I give you each like 30 seconds for a closing statement? Um, maybe, Mr. Badaway, if you want to go first before passing the mic on to uh, Mr. Biddle. Sure. I think Chris made a good point earlier with respect to uh, when the, the red tape question. You know, we're here. We're here for you guys. We're MPs, members of Parliament. And at the end of the day, uh, whether it's now, whether it's uh, after COVID, you know, anything that, that, that concerns you or that, or that bogs you down, just pick up the phone or a phone call away. Uh, secondly, and, and probably most important now in, in, in the business community, uh, is, is, is to communicate with us in terms of what those continual challenges are so that we can respond accordingly, uh, as we have been since COVID started. But equally as important is post-COVID. You know, what do we learn from this? 
what are some of the, uh, the things that we're going to come out with the new norm? Uh, now, do people work at home more? What, 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 what presents as an advantage to that? Uh, and other uh, things that, that you're noticing right now uh, under this new norm. So I guess the overall, the overall uh, message is communication. And, uh, as much as we're working together with our partners at all levels of government, it's equally as important, if not more important, to work with the private sector as well. Thank you so very much, Mr. Barry. Mr. Bill? It's tough for politicians to answer something in 30 seconds, so I'll just say thank you for listening. And like Van said, if you do have any questions or concerns, don't hesitate to contact us. We're happy to uh, bring your message forward to Ottawa. So thank you. Thank you very much. On behalf of uh, all of Niagara's uh, Chambers of Commerce and the Meridian Credit Union, thank you very much for being with us this morning. Um, we spoke of a few resources and subsidies that are available for complete list. list. Please check our website. Uh, and if you would like to reach out to any of us directly because you have any specific questions, um, want to be part of our daily updates on this, we can be reached at info at gncc.ca. A special thanks to Meridian Credit Union for supporting this morning's uh, dialogue. The Canadian Federation of Independent Business Service, uh, its members in the area of financing fees, account management and service every year since 2009 and Canada's credit unions rank as the preferred financial institution of Canada's small and medium sized business businesses. So thank you for everything that you do for Niagara and in the business community. And lastly, to all participants, thank you for joining us. Please stay in touch and above all, stay healthy. Thank you.